And now for something completely machinima. Tracy Harwood. Um, so I've done a little bit of digging around and I've discovered. Ricky Grove. Fog comes in on little cat feet. <laughs> Phil Rice. This is the best film that I've seen all year and maybe ever. Damien Valentine. Use the machinima, Luke. Hello and welcome to And Now for Something Completely Machinima, a podcast about machinima, virtual production, and related technologies. My name's Phil Rice, and I'm here with my co-hosts Tracy Harwood and Damian Valentine and Hello. generative AI, Ricky Grove. Hey, Ricky, how are you? That's just terrific. Thank you. <laughs> so in this episode, we have two films to discuss. One of them is Tracy's pick for the month and the other is Damien's pick for the month. And we're going to let AI Ricky choose. Now, the two films are uh, Damien's film is titled Day of Darkness. And Tracy's film or Day of Darkness 2, excuse me. And Tracy's pick is titled The Wanderer. The Wanderer is like a Team Fortress 2, I think, vibe. It's a Source Engine film. And Day of Darkness 2 is EVE Online. So, Ricky, that's all the information. You do your processing thing. That's your training data set, Ricky. So, all you have to do is just pick one of the films, and we'll go with that first. So, Ricky... Take it away. Just go ahead and uh, just go ahead and take it away. Uh, all you have to do is just this is a binary thing, just zero or one. Do you want it to be this one or that one? It's just all you have to do is just pick one. Just just. Snakes are not my friends. No, no. I find snakes to be abhorrent. Can you pick a film, please? I'm sorry. Sorry, everybody. Uh. I'll bleep that. Don't worry. <clears throat> uh, okay, well, you know what? Uh, uh, Ricky seems to have uh, some trouble deciding, and I guess that makes sense because these are both strong picks. Let's let's let that's my story and I'm sticking to it. So uh, let's start with Damien. Damien, right. your pick. Go ahead. Um, so normally I, I tell the story about how I came across this film. And I don't remember how I came across this film because I saw it a long time ago. <laughs> but what reminded me of it, I was working on Air to the Empire and I was working on this big space battle scene. And I was thinking about, you know, now I can control the ships and move the camera around and you know never really able to do that before and i thought well, not many other machinima films have done big space battles like this either and they're, they're very restrictive and i thought actually wait a minute there was a film i saw a long time ago that had this kind of feel where the ships are moving and the camera is tracking them but slightly off and shaking a little bit and it was so well done i couldn't remember what it was called <laughs> so i had to do a little bit of digging and then I eventually found it, and it's called Day of Darkness 2. Now, there's a Day of Darkness 1, but it's kind of... it's it, Day of Darkness 1 is set in EVE Online, but it's not really related to this story as such. Um, so, what it was about was the uh, creator of the film, uh, Daya Lothris, I hope I haven't butchered your name. Um, uh, he created a number of EVE Online videos um, uh, back in the height of the game. And he got the attention of the studio, CCP Games. Um, I don't remember which film of his that got their attention, but uh, it may have been Day of Darkness 1. They invited him to the studio. I think it was for a day or two. Uh, so they flew him out to Iceland, where, the, where they're based. And they let him play around with the cinematic tools that they use for their own um, 
cinematics when they're creating trailers for the game. Uh, and so he could do whatever he wanted. Uh, he could save the footage and then he would take it back home and edit it in his own time because his time at the studio was very limited. Uh, so he created this story which was based on the lore of the game, uh, some his a historical event that happened two years, uh, 200 years before the actual game takes place. And so um, he, there's a little bit in the comments that he talks about how he had to pick out ship designs that were very old because the idea that um, they would have been around 200 years ago and he tried tried his best to figure out which ones they would be uh, and all that. He didn't want a thing that was you know just been released in the time period of the game to be in this setting 200 years ago. Um, so he created this footage and he put this together and I would say it's his best video. Um, he hasn't really made anything since. This video is about 16 years old. Uh, so it, it's quite an old uh, machinery video but it visually it holds up really well and in the comments section, there's a an HD version. But when you click on the link to the EVE Online website, that video page no longer exists. Um, I found some other copies that people have re-uploaded, but I wanted to link directly to the original creator's version, which is not the HD one, but it is the original uh, Machinima creator. I think that that's important to re to reflect that. But if you want to see a higher quality version, uh, you can you know find that uh, quite easily on YouTube. Uh, but yeah, when I watched this film originally, I was so impressed and blown away by this space battle he'd animated. Uh, obviously, I'm an interest in this kind of thing. Um, and you know, I watched it again for this, and I thought this really holds up just as well as I remember it holding up. You know, sometimes you can watch a film that you haven't seen in a long time, and actually, it, it's not quite the way I remember it. This does, and uh, I, this is going to be my pick for the month. So I wanted to share it with you guys and share it with our community. So, uh, what did you think? Well, I've Damien, done a... I have a. Oh, oh go, go ahead, on. Tracy. Well, I was going to say I've done a. I've done a bit of digging. So, do you want me to sort of <laughs> fill in a little bit of the background uh, as well? Um, sure. Which I, which I, I think I can do. Um, however, what I will start by saying this: I, I could not believe how old this was. Actually, fifteen years old, two thousand and nine, it was released. Um, but for me, it's all about the cinematic music. This kind of big cinematic music. And also the quality and drama of the of the narrative description of the action and the voice acting by Stevie Ward, who was this, um, well, it turns out she actually um, did the tutorial for the game. So she was um, a professional uh, voice actor. Um, although it's got a glaring mistake in it, um, which I think is, I you know, it just really sort of shouted at me when she was... Um, Speaking anyway, I I thought the 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 editing and the action scenes um uh, and the narration just just brilliantly well done. Fifteen years old, I couldn't believe it. It's um I think it's held together incredibly well, uh, and I think incredibly well, clearly because it is considered by the the fan community to be one of the best cinematics ever created in the game and it's still held up as an exemplar of its time so the fact that you've kind of brought it to us and sort of um reintroduced us to it i think is is um it's it's, it's really timely um obviously i'm not that familiar with this uh th this game and I'm, and i'm certainly not very familiar with uh the eve storyline however the chronicles as they are known are the short stories about different aspects of this kind of fictional world and in this case the story is about an aspect referred to as the breakout and around the time that it was made as I understand it there were about 168 chronicles uh, and this film was really an extension to one of those chronicles obviously fan developed um, so it appears from the the various discussion threads about the film that uh, it's one of those films that has since been accepted as part of the game law, including by CCP. Now, I tried to find out what happened to the creator um, because apparently shortly after publishing this particular film, he just disappeared and his character was deleted. I did manage to find some of the background to the making of the film though. Uh, and at the time, Dyer Lothris, he kind of commented that he'd initially tried making the film in 3ds max 
with uh, apparently hilariously bad results. And in fact, he then asked CCP if they could help him out with the locations and some of the, the complexes to use on Sissy because he wanted to make it as, as, as he described, as historically accurate to the game as possible. And instead of threatening him with a copyright claim, apparently, what they did then was invited him, as you said, Damien, over to their offices to let, let him have a tinker with the software that they actually use for making their own videos. And as a consequence of that, he was then able to um, use a cut down version um, to actually make the film. Um, so he says without, or he said at the time, without CCP's support, he would probably never have um, been able to make what he actually then made and put it out in the way that it that it um, it was actually put out. Um, but also on top of that, they offered um, Stevie, the the voice actor, um, to do the voiceover for him, um, uh, who was actually one of the employees of CCP at the time. I, it apparently it took him several years to make it. The project began in two thousand and seven, and obviously was only finally released late in in two thousand and nine. Like I said, I think the the mistake, the voice mistake, uh, grinded is the word that that she used instead of ground presumably um turns out it was a mistake that stevie made in in the in the narration rather than something that he made and apparently he said he just missed it when he was doing the um the the edit the response from the community to it was especially notable uh obviously you remember it really well um even though you couldn't remember what it was called i think but i think at the time what what seemed to happen was that there were many in that community that called on CCP to hire him. Now, I found some suggestion that, in fact, that is what happened, although I never, I couldn't actually find out who he is in, in real life uh, and, and, and what exactly his name is or how long he continued to work for them. But obviously, you know, having his character deleted shortly after and, and him never producing any other films would strongly suggest that he has then got a relationship with CCP and that was part of the deal. Um, so he's probably the one that's made all the the Eve videos since, I would have thought. It's always kind of really cool, I think, to hear that actually machinima pioneers, such as this guy clearly was, end up having a career, you know, with a, with a developer or, or going on to do creative work as a consequence of what they created as a, as a fan of the game. Um, and... I think it would be really cool if we could actually kind of close this story out and sort of him come forward and say, right, this is what I ended up doing as a consequence of of having created this this massively influential film at the at the time. I you know, some of the stuff that I found, I actually found it on um, the Wayback Machine uh, with with some of the links. And, uh, and you can download the film as, a, as an HD version using um the the web archive so if you're if you're really stuck and and you can't find it i think go back to the wayback machine see if you can find a copy of it through the through the back channels so to speak from the old from the old websites which all have links to it there's many many articles that actually have links to um high quality um versions of the of the film so although i don't think it is actually on the um uh, the 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 actual machinima archive that sits in the internet archive itself um, that Stanford put together. I don't I don't remember seeing a copy of it there, um, but that's all I could kind of find out about it. So it's a really good pick, really interesting of its time, um, and especially interesting because of the career trajectory of the creator. So thanks for sharing it. Glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, I feel like there that there's there's two ways. To, uh, there's at least two ways to evaluate this film. And one is as an EVE Online film. And the other is just as a film. Um, and I think as a, what I mean by that is, is if you evaluate it as an EVE Online film, then you accept the fact that everything that you see is going to be from EVE Online there's nothing additional except for maybe uh, a little bit of not very good camera shake at points, you know, some post-production type stuff. But 
<clears throat> as a story generally, um, I found that I struggled because I wanted someone to connect with. And you just can't connect with a hull, you know? And I think that the but reading through the comments, there's a lot of people who were, were very, you know, I mean, it's in a very emotional story. Um, you know, it's a kind of a, uh, a, a classic hero trope of the captain going down with his ship kind of kind of story, you know, at 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 one point. And some of the people in the comments, you can see that they really had an emotional response to it. But they were definitely Eve online players. And I think it would be near impossible to get a real to get the same level of visceral emotional reaction to someone who isn't who hasn't invested imagination and emotion into that game world to where you, the imagination, when you play Eve online enough, your imagination fills in that missing element and, and the sense of there being people uh, involved comes to light. It's your imagination that brings that the game doesn't give you that really, you know, it's very much about space warfare and space combat and, and ships and, and dealing with thing at, at this macro level. Um, so that's, that's where I, I struggled with it, but even though I've, I've played a little bit of Eve online, um, it, there, there's such a, uh, learning curve to master it that I've kind of shied away from it uh, because the time investment to, I think really master that game is, is more than I'm willing to, to put into it um there may even be a monetary investment part of it too that i haven't even gotten into yet but i mean there it's a free to play game but obviously there's there's things that are going to be accelerated or or improved with some some paid options um it's an amazing the staying power of the game is amazing like it's still that community is still going strong there's still a lot people that play that game regularly um and have for a long time um so the level of detail in the game is incredible just incredible um if if, if it's a if someone's a kind of a fan of high hard sci-fi or someone who's got like an engineering mindset that game would just be you know the perfect fit you know, because the, the the kinds of details in just in outfitting your craft and stuff is amazing. Um, anyway, that's that's kind of where I ended up coming away from it. Pro production quality wise, I mean, it's just it's beautiful. And yeah, it's hard to believe this video is 15 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and having I've logged into the game within the last 60 days and I can tell you that it. I mean, it doesn't look visually lacking at all. Like it still I don't know if. I don't know if it's evolved or upgraded much over the years. I actually don't know uh, because I'm fairly new to having downloaded the game. But I mean, it's gorgeous looking. Um, and and this 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 video is is other than some of the post production stuff that that the, the fake camera shake thing really is a personal pet peeve of mine. It it, it bugs me. Um, but you know the the shot choices and the, the just the beautiful way that this game lights things for you if you angle it right and stuff. Um, the the effects of of the explosions and the the combat and all that. I mean, there's no denying it's just it's it's, it's gorgeous. But I, I found myself I found myself craving what a clear skies mm -hmm. use of this would have brought. That's mm -hmm. how he solved that. Mm -hmm. He used clear he used Eve online for his space battle scenes, right? Am I mm -hmm. am I right on that? Am I remembering right, Damien? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. He did. But he used Source Engine or Half-Life 2 characters to bring the human feel. And the result is I mean, of course, clear skies. If you haven't seen that, go find it and watch it. Stop, stop watching this and go find that and watch it right now. It's so good. Uh <laughs> and you want to talk about something that'll grip you and and make you feel something. Uh, clear skies one and two my goodness so i uh, maybe that's why maybe having come from a 
you know, a, a, a long time appreciator of clear skies, um, that, that I came to this film and noticed that lack more than I might have otherwise. Uh, I don't know. It's hard to be objective about that, but um, definitely well made. And it is a cool story that, you know, we, we all know several uh, people who um, did machinima in, in this era and then ended up catapulting into a, uh, into various careers. I mean, it's, it is neat. Um, you know, I, I have mixed feelings on it, of course, because part of me still mourns the loss yeah. of that yeah. creative talent. And this lost is exactly to, the time. Yeah. yeah. This was exactly the time when we talk about the great machinima brain drain, don't we? For yeah. Yeah. the creators being absorbed by the developers. This is yeah. exactly that period of time. So several higher ups at several companies all got the same idea at the same time as far mm -hmm. as this is a real uh, a, a real opportunity for, to to this is a skill set we need on our team. That's kind of what and, they all said, and just and snatched tell, them up, and it's great. You can tell from playing games because they try to be cinematic, but oh, the, more than ever, the, absolutely. But they weren't like mm -hmm. the camera angles are off, and it was weird and stuff. And then suddenly, yeah, only they were only very square cinematic. only SquareSoft was doing it, and they had a completely different department doing their cinematics. You know, yeah. they were they and everybody wanted that, but they wanted to do it in engine. Yeah. Like like Squaresoft does now with fan, Final Fantasy. So, um, yeah, that's that's what kind of set that bar so high is is what Square. Square Enix or Xenix or wh whatever their full name was, the Final Fantasy developers. Yeah, they had these just ridiculous, beautiful cinematics. And then and then not so great you know, graphics in the game itself, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, these developers like BioWare and others came along and just says, we should be able to merge those worlds now. You know, the tech yeah. has come along that we can simultaneously bring the game quality up and have the, to, to where it can also handle the cinematics. And that, yeah, these guys were all part of that wave. And now it's it's just taken for granted. That's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody's, I don't think any game of merit is doing pre-rendered video cinematics anymore there's just no reason to it's it's so inefficient and frankly you can't get as good a quality out of that as you can out of the when you, when you get the graphics card to do it right so they all figured that out yeah and so i it's it's neat that uh this was a story we weren't aware of that uh, of someone who uh who achieved achieved that that's that's really great so yeah i i, I think it's a beautiful film i i found myself missing the human connection part of it and and felt like that would have made it more powerful. I didn't recognize the voice actor. Um, I knew I'd heard the voice somewhere before, but I, even though I've played the, the game a little bit and I'm still in the tutorial stage. So I've, I've heard plenty of her, but I didn't realize it. Maybe it just, because I just assumed couldn't be the, couldn't be the voice. I mean, yeah. Yeah. They're just, they're just voice actors who will, you know, hire out sometimes. So that's great. Anyway, I'm glad you picked that, Damien. Uh, Ricky, what's your thoughts on this film? I'm not a political person, but if I was, I would probably be left of center, but maybe a little right of center or below center. Yeah, it's below center is where I'm. I'm, I'm probably where i should be you know i hadn't thought about that that's that's an interesting take uh yeah. let's move on to uh to tracy's film uh yes. tracy's film is titled the wanderer why don't you tell us about it absolutely yeah the wanderer source filmmaker short film and it's by dominsky and it was released earlier this year 8th of march um now, it's set in the Team Fortress 2 world. Our lead character is wandering through the landscape alone. This is a theme this month. Um, this guy has got no real sense of where he's going, seemingly. Um, there's clearly a war going on around him. Um, 
and he's on the run or he's hiding from others uh, or the other side and others are trying to defend themselves uh, or, or something like that is going on in what appears to be this kind of post-apocalyptic kind of environment. What's really interesting in this, I think, is the device of um, a female character. Um, and she's dressed in a kind of homely way. Uh, and he uses, uh, I, th I think Dom Dominsky basically uses this, this female character to communicate what I think is basically the lead character, the male character's humanity. I think that's kind of what's, I think that's what 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 she's there for to connect back to a a human life rather than this horrible world that he now inhabits. He basically follows this woman, or or at least she is leading him through this world, this post apocalyptic world. Um, I couldn't get sense when I started watching it of of quite what what she was. I thought maybe she might be a ghost or an angel, or maybe a memory. Um, we're never really told exactly, although in the end she is revealed. Um, she appears to him at times of extreme danger, as if warning him of something terrible that is about to happen. Um, but she also stops him from doing some things that would appear to me to be things that he might regret. Um so yeah, there's kind of this interesting relationship between this kind of male and, and this is female. I think what I really liked about it was the editing. That there's there's real violence in this. You get a real sense of the the violence, and it's really graphic. Um, except for the fact that the the way that it's communicated um, doesn't re doesn't really show you the graphic nature of it. You just you just know that it is graphic and it and it's portrayed through these kind of really frenzied scenes and they and these scenes are kind of shattered so it's it's almost like this guy is um you know he's lost his he's lost the full sense of what it was he's done as he's as he's um engaged in these um these these frenzied uh attacks really I suppose is what you call them um I thought that was such a clever way of mm. illustrating the, the 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 kind of demonic nature of this the, this horror of 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 war that this guy's um you know cap captured in really um it's it's a very interesting way of portraying the character's emotion um which you you know it, it's kind of hard to get the sense of what the emotion is because you never see a face from of, of the character at all but just just the way it moves the way it behaves and then these these this sort of frenzied stuff um and the and this kind of like fragmentation is almost like out of body in the way that it's um represented the other thing that i really liked about it is the use of color which is absolutely fascinating um, you know, he's using really dark blues and grey tones for the war and the wandering sense of it and full colour and lighter shades for what is actually quite an uplifting ending to this horror story. Um, and and then the portrayal of this woman is maybe a bit in between the two. Um, not not quite the full light shades, but certainly lighter than the 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 main sort of depiction of it um and then the other thing that i really liked was the device of the crow that's that's been used so you get the sense of a crow uh, which is all associated with death being 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 in there as well there are there are absolutely no words said in this the whole thing is told through music which i think is brilliantly edited to fit the themes of the story um, there are different musical tones and sounds associated with the different characters. For example, there's a lighter, a more upbeat tempo when the woman appears in the in the in the shot. Um, I think he's he's used. I think he's used that music incredibly well. I think um, 
there's one I mean there's there's one scene in it which really stood out to me where there's a where there's a fight and he's used the beats of the drum in in the in the music um as the the timing for the for the for the punches i mean it's it's beautifully timed i mean how on earth he did that i, I mean it's amazing how he's done it because the music i i don't believe the music was written specifically for the scene so he's obviously tied the scene to the music i think which is an interesting way of going about doing it now he's he's drawn on different inspirations for this um and what he says is he's drawn from games like 40k fallout metro uh, and stalker but also movies like the book of eli and you really get a sense of kind of different inspirations but not not in a in a, a parody kind of way. It's very interesting how it's been done, I think. The the it's it's part of a series called Mission. Um and be, because I thought this one was so compelling, I was actually I actually watched um others as well. I have to say I'm totally blown away with the quality of this guy's storytelling. It's it's really outstanding, I think. So if if you know if you get a chance, do watch the others. I think there's about five in the series, all worth watching. Different lengths, which I think is also quite interesting. Um, definitely recommend them. Now, just to say, um, in terms of Dominsky, he, he's an animator and a machinima creator. He's He's um, got some real chops in source. He's been um, he's been making source films for, for many years, I believe. Uh, is a really good interview with him in Man Magazine, <laughs> which was launched not not that long ago um and i'll put a, a show notes uh link to that um so you can kind of have a have a look at it um but yeah bit of an overview bit of a, a set of thoughts about it i don't know what you guys thought about it yes yeah, so i was remembering that other film that we saw with source filmmaker that used uh team fortress characters was that two months ago the uh the film noir kind of story with the all the different characters and it kind of goes off in some right. very wild directions. Oh, and Mises and, Blue. Yeah. And I was, what came to mind was, uh, I'd never actually played Team Fortress myself, but the impression I got was it's kind of a cartoony, it's violent, but in a cartoony kind of way to make it more family friendly. Uh, and it's supposed to be fun and very lighthearted, even though it's a team competitive kind of game. And what, these two creators have done is they've taken those characters and put them into some really dark stories and situations. Now I'm not going to talk about the other film because we're, we're here to talk about this one. Um, but instead of having the, the red and blue teams in a sort of comedy kind of aspect like the game is, uh, it's still got that conflict, but it's made into a very dark and serious kind of way. And you've got this, this main character with the mask and he's, haunted by everything he's experienced uh, in this battle. Um, I'm assuming that the location is one of the maps or several of the maps um, from the game that they've uh, used. Um, and so, you know, you know that, that fun aspect of it, he, he's just really ground down by all this death and violence that he's seen. And he, for a moment, I actually thought, this is probably what the characters, the actual characters feel, not the players who are having a great time blowing each other up, but the actual characters in the world are probably seeing it this way, mm. which, um, uh, you know, if they could, you know, feel that way, that's probably what they'd be thinking. And obviously he's haunted by this nurse character throughout the film. And um, he has several encounters with the red team. Uh, Tracy, you were talking about how the colors are muted. I noticed even the red team who are going to stand out with the, the red color, their colors are muted against, you know, this environment, which I think helps portray that this is a war and it, it's not even though that it shows that the red team it's this is a, a darker uh, more serious story um and yeah you don't the only time he takes his mask off the camera is behind his head so you still can't see his face and then he puts the mask back on yeah uh which i thought was a nice touch it kind of makes him i don't know it, it, it you don't get to see him you you can feel what he must be going through by the way he moves, he's so well animated that you you understand 
uh, what's happening. And there's a scene where he's having a fight. He's having a nice fight with someone. He's got them on the ground. And you're right, it's a very brutal way, but you don't actually see what happens. All you see is a hand like this, uh, well, like this, out of the, coming out of the edge of the screen, and it kind of twitches, and it goes limp, and you see a pool of blood come off the side. Yeah. And so you know exactly what's happened, but you don't see it. Yeah. And I think that adds more to the tone and violence of the film, because if you show it, no matter how well you animate it, it's not going to have the same impact as not showing it because the way he did show it was so well done. Uh, there was one thing that I think maybe Bill and R Ricky would be able to comment on. It's, the music was well done. I was wondering if maybe it needed a few sound effects. I'm not sure if that would work or not. Like, like the scene I was just talking about, you don't hear a stab sound. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, would that have made it worse or is it better without? And I think I'll leave it to to Phil and to, to Ricky to uh, answer that one because I, you know you guys are the sound experts uh, but visually it was so well done and um, it must have taken a huge amount of work to, to animate it that well because I know that the source filmmaker is a very complex piece of software that's not easy to, to pick up and use and you know to make something of this quality with it is that it takes a long time to learn it and then to actually put that knowledge to use you know to create a film like this and it's what was it about nine minutes long so that's a long that's a long mm. film to make something that with software that you know is very complicated mm. um so yeah i have a huge amount of respect for this filmmaker i need to to go and check out those other films in the series uh which i didn't realize there were i, I didn't realize there were more so i'll check out his channel and see what else he's done because mm. uh definitely a lot of talent there and uh, i'd like to see more of it yeah, my very first note was could use some sound effects in some spots. Yeah, okay. Um, the the use of music was was well done <clears throat> for the most part. It wasn't composed for the film. Um, it's he uses a uh, a paid music library called uh, Epidemic Sound. There's several out 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 there like this. Um, Artlist.io is one, and Epidemic is another one that's very popular. Um, where you can get, uh, it, they, they basically offer you access to a, a library of high quality music and it takes care of all the YouTube content ID, you know, uh, stuff for you uh, as part of your license for it. So, and his selection, he used several different selections and um, yeah, there's some there's some points where it works really well. Like the, the one Tracy highlighted where the, uh, the hits, you know, seem to be, coordinated i i can't tell if that's part of the music track or if he maybe didn't uh augment it a little bit with just the booms because it's so precise yeah i, I don't know how he would animate it to that music and the chances of finding a music with those low-end booms timed exactly like that so maybe he had somebody layer something over for just the booms and and the underlying track at that point was just still either way the effect was great um where i think it wasn't as good is shortly after that um right at the midpoint of the film there's the the most graphic stabbing scene and i say graphic not gory because that's what this film is it, it does have a graphicness to it that reminds me a little bit of the approach to violence in uh Leo, Lucien Bay's The Beast, or Beast. Oh, yeah. You know, that's yeah. an yeah. extremely violent film, but it's not gory. It's not bloody, you know, it's not, there's no guts. It's not a slasher film, you know, and this this is that type of violent. It's, it's graphic because, uh, well, it's animated well, but also the emotional impact of it, you feel. Um to me that that's a that's a type of graphic violence that doesn't have anything to do with cuts and bruises you know so anyway that most graphic stabbing scene um horrific um and at that point the music is just kind of still bouncing along with this you know this this rock action sequence um i don't know there's other choices that that could have been made there that that is a 
that's a definite low point for that character, you know? Like that's a massive that's a you don't come back from it moment to lose it like that to to get really when war overtakes a person and they behave like that maybe it was necessary but he'll never be the same after that you know mm -hmm. uh and for that reason alone for for me it's like okay something you know maybe the music needs to stop um maybe there's just breathing or would the stab sounds make it too graphic i don't know i mean it's a it's a brutal scene uh, even to watch it muted, it's just brutal. Uh, anyway, the, at that point, the music wasn't appropriate. It just, it it took me out of it. It's like, all right, if you're going to take us to that dark place, go ahead and take us there. You know, not, not with a, a bopping soundtrack. But for the most part, the, the selections that he, he made were excellent. And, and the, the timing of them, the mood of them was apt. It's only that one central scene that really stuck out to me. Uh, I was a little uncertain, even after the reveal at the end, I was still a little bit uncertain about the identity of this woman. Mm. Um, and it, it was it was interesting to hear you, Tracy, kind of iterate through all these possibilities of memory ghost or or something else. and because it's like, yeah, it's even after watching it, reflecting on it, it's like, okay, so, if that's a memory, just as one of the examples, is that, is it someone that's back home waiting for him? Is it someone he's lost? Is it a love interest or is it, is it his childhood memory of what his mother looked like? I don't know. There's like, I, mean, yeah. it, I don't know. Did I miss, did I overlook something that made it, made it obvious it wasn't his mom? Like, did they make out and I missed it or something? I don't remember that, but. I just really found myself questioning what the identity of the woman was. It didn't detract from the film at all uh, because, because of the way that that character was used in the film, that, that the device works. Whether or not you pin down specifically who that is or was and what happened to them or what didn't or... I mean, he he could be schizophrenic and imagining her. It doesn't matter for the film. For the film, there's a certain role that 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 female plays, uh, which you highlighted already. A lot of it, you know, it's all there, there's times when it's almost like a Jiminy Cricket character to to his Pinocchio, you know, like a, a conscience, like you said. Uh, uh, there's other times where it's it's a source of comfort. Um, this this almost watching over him while he sleeps, whether that's really happening or if that's, you know, yeah. what his, his mental state is, is that, that there's a safety there. Um, yeah. The way that she's whisked away before he passes out near the end, I won't go further than that on the ending. I, I hate spoilers, but yeah, it's a very mysterious figure. Um, There's certain ways that the main villain of No Country for Old Men, if you've ever seen it, the Coen Brothers movie, the main the main villain in that, uh, Anton uh, Chigurh. There's certain decisions that the director made, especially in the ending scenes of that film, where it left the viewer with questions of: Is this guy real? Is he a ghost? What what is he exactly? You know, the 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 the, the scene in particular I'm thinking of is where. Tommy Lee Jones, the, you know, the old sheriff shows up to the scene of the crime and they kind of, the shot sequence makes you think that the murderer is inside, but then he goes in and nobody's there. And so it's, it leaves you with these questions and they never get answered. Like they just don't. And, and yet it works. Like it doesn't make, no one says that's not a great film because of that. You know, they may not like it for some reason. They'd be wrong. But uh, because it is one of the all time greats. Anyway, so the point is, those questions can be unanswered and it's still OK. It still works. And I think that's true here, that that 
I think there's multiple valid ways to view this film with regards to who is that that female character. And I think that the multiple ones can work, you know. So and I like that. We we've talked in previous episodes about skillfully wielded ambiguity, you know, which is a much, much different effect than accidental or ineptitude leading to ambiguity. You didn't think of it. And so it's ambiguous or you just didn't write it good enough or didn't get a second opinion or whatever. And so something's ambiguous and then it leaves the viewer feeling dissatisfied. This isn't that. Um, I get the impression that the that the director of this film knows who that woman is. And the way it's played out, that's enough for me. You know, it'd be, it, it would play off totally different if she was just deliberately written to be mysterious and, and vague and whatnot. No, there's, there's something distinct there. He just chooses not to define it. And I think it was a very smart choice. Mm. Very smart. Mm. Um, I love silent films, silent short works like this. Um, I don't, you know, I don't love everything from the silent film era in Hollywood, but I love what independent filmmakers like this do with a silent film. I think there's there's virtues of doing a film with no dialogue, with no spoken words that are numerous. There's practical ones of the international appeal, the instant uh, barriers that get crossed in terms of the audience that can understand this film or that can enjoy it and experience it. Um, and also... I think for a skillful storyteller, which which Dominsky clearly is, uh, it's kind of a tying one hand behind your back, you know, Inigo Montoya in uh, The Princess Bride, you know, I'm actually left handed, you know, it's I'm not saying that he did to show off, but I'm saying that. Uh, I don't know, it's like choosing to paint with a specific palette. You know, that doesn't mean that you don't know how to use other colors, but for this painting, I'm going to use this this palette and restrict myself to that. Or, uh, well, I don't know. Our whole medium is about working with limitations, right? But some of those limitations are imposed upon us by the engine, by what we know how to do in the engine, things like that. And some of them, sometimes you self-impose a limitation Um and just like when a person has one of their senses deprived, the other senses heighten to compensate for it. I feel like that in this weird inverse way, a silent film like this, it it the visual storytelling just pops all the more mm. because there's no words in the way. I don't know. I don't know how else to say it, but you you get what I'm what I'm getting at. Um so uh, there's so much to appreciate in this film. It's got a couple flaws. Uh, most films do, right? Uh, every single one of my film has at least a couple. Um, but it's wonderful. And um, yeah, Source Filmmaker is kind of notoriously challenging to work with. So there's just, there's there's a long list of reasons to respect this uh, this work and to and to look out for more from from Dominsky it's it's uh this is the kind of stuff we want to watch you know it's just yeah. it's just good it's just really good and moving mm -hmm. and uh and the ending is a real surprise and we won't won't spoil it but pleasant surprise yeah did you feel that way about it too like yeah it, it, yeah it Phew. sure didn't it <laughs> did not it did not seem like it was gonna go that way no and uh yeah, well done. Well done. So uh, we'll let Ricky weigh in now. Uh, Ricky, what did you think of The Wanderer? Have you ever made banana nut bread? Oh, man. The worst part is waiting for the bananas to get rotten. They don't realize that the best banana banana nut bread is made with rotten bananas. <laughs> I'm beginning to think this wasn't a good idea. Yeah. 
Well, thanks, Ricky. That was insightful. Uh, man, I miss the real Ricky a lot. I bet you guys do too. Hey, we'd love your feedback. So drop us a comment or an email at talk at completelymachinima.com. On behalf of myself, Phil Rice and Damian Valentine and Tracy Harwood and the soon-to-be-retired Generative AI Ricky. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Ricky. You're that's, we, we need the real Rickster back. We'll see you all next time. Thanks a lot. Bye.